Welcome to Mass Culture's MC Minds, where we delve deeper into the intelligence of Canadian thought leaders in the arts. My name is Catherine Gertsema. Today, Mass Culture Operations Group members Christian Clark, Executive Director of the Dancer Transition Resource Centre, and multi-artist Clayton Windat interview policy consultant Gary Neal about his book, Canadian Culture in a Globalized World. Stay tuned to find out how you can get this book for a discount of 20%. We're excited as operations group members, Clayton Windat and myself, to be having a discussion with you, Gary, about this book called Canadian Culture in a Globalized World, the impact of trade deals on Canada's cultural life, which came out early 2019. Before we get into sort of discussing the book and some of the key points that I think that you're getting at, I thought we might just introduce Clayton Windat. And Clayton, do you want to just talk a little bit about your connection to mass culture and your connection to the cultural community and what you're up to now? Gary, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and interviewing you as well. So my name is Clayton Windat, and I'm, as Christian said, on the Mass Culture uh, Board or, or Founding Committee, whatever, whatever incarnation we're, to, we're, we're calling it, because Mass Culture has done a lot of shifting and a lot of changing and a lot of growing over the last two years. And well, we keep having to come up with these different terms, but it's really good because it's the sign of consistent growth and self-evaluation. I am a Métis non-binary multi-artist and I, I say that and it's like this huge encompassing thing but one of the reasons why I'm so invested in mass culture and why I'm here is that I'm also deeply interested in artist rights and seeing labor rights start entering into the everyday process that artists engage with in Canada and mostly because I think Canada has an opportunity to do things that maybe other countries don't. And, you know, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer, and I do a lot of grants. I I work in the arts as an administrator and a curator. So there's just this whole spectrum of stuff with a lot of art service experience. So I got involved with Mass Culture because I think that having a hub for arts research to live is a really beautiful thing and that we need that. But I also think that Canada needs to maintain a critical voice to ensure our civic engagement is active. It's part of what makes us who we are in this country. Welcome, Gary. Maybe you can talk about some of your background with regards to the various arts groups you have worked with and some of the other not-for-profit organizations, both nationally and internationally, that you have spent some time with. I got my start in the cultural business in Canada in 1977 when I was hired by ACTRA, which at that point was the union of performers, writers, and broadcast journalists in the English language recorded media. Um, And I was hired to negotiate collective bargaining agreements. So Clayton, I'm fully aware of the the need to improve the circumstances of uh, artists in this country. Um, And I I worked for ACTRA for 15 years. I gradually became the boss, the general secretary. And I was spending more of my time working on cultural policy issues than I was working on the collective bargaining because we had a team of people who did that. And I found that I was really intrigued and interested and, and I think reasonably good at making the case for Canadian culture to Canadian politicians. And so when I left ACTRA in 1992, it was with the idea of becoming a cultural policy consultant. When I'm in Europe and I say I'm a cultural policy consultant, everybody instantly gets it. When I'm in Canada and I say I'm a cultural policy consultant, I get a blank stare. And I have to say, well, you know, in Canada, we rely a lot on government policies and programs to support our artists and cultural producers and cultural professionals. And so my job is working for various governments and uh, NGOs and organizations and even some businesses to influence the public policy development process. So I've been doing that since 1992. I also spent brief time as the executive director of the Association of Canadian Publishers. So I was uh, heavily immersed in the book industry for a few years. I also spent really the better part of a decade traveling the world talking about cultural diversity issues. And this is connected, of course, with my book. We in Canada realized that it really was unacceptable to be in this situation of constantly being in the negative. We were opposing trade agreements. We wanted an exemption for, from trade agreements. And so we developed this idea in Canada that what we needed was a new international instrument that would support the sovereign right of states to support their own artists and cultural producers. And so from 1999, again, for about a decade or more, I traveled the world building support for this idea, which in fact led in 2005 to the negotiation of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and the Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, 
We'll come back to the UNESCO convention in this conversation, I'm sure. Because while it didn't accomplish the objective immediately, it does provide a really interesting framework that I think we need to use far more than we we have done. So that's that's me. I mean, I've worked for ACTRA for all of these years as a, as a cultural policy advisor. I've worked for various film and television producers. I've worked, as I said, in the book publishing industry. I've done some work in the magazine industry. I've done some work in the performing arts world. I've done some studies for government, provinces of British Columbia, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and the federal governments. And I have some international clients as well. I have some American clients, and I've had clients in other countries. So that's who I am. The reason that I alluded to the broader not-for-profit community when I introduced you was that you've also spent some time as, uh, I believe it was the Executive Director of the Council for Canadians. I have always done a lot of volunteer work in the sector. So yes, I've been on many boards and I've been chair of the Dancer Transition Resource Centre. I was the previous chair of the Canadian Senior Artist Resource Network. I'm still on the boards of both of those organizations. I was a former vice president of the Canadian Conference of the Arts. And so I welcome the Mass Culture Initiative because it really is replacing something that uh, that we sorely miss. And yes, I spent some time with the Council of Canadians, which is a, um, a, a citizens movement in Canada of close to 100,000 members from coast to coast to coast. Uh, that uh, is is really was was really in the forefront of uh, civil society opposition to to the Harper government particularly. And I spent five years as their executive director. I just want to remind people what we're going to be talking about, which is this publication that Gary has been alluding to. If you're watching this podcast, if you have the the luxury of enjoying this conversation, you will be eligible for a 20% discount as a mass culture email list subscriber. So thank you, Lormer, which is the publisher, and Gary for making that happen. I already bought it, so I don't get the discount. (laughs) <laughs> I'll buy you a drink when we get together next. How's that? That's great. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're right, Gary. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to start off with was to to talk about the fact that uh, you know a lot of um, international trade agreements are referenced in this book, but they're referenced in regards to um, uh, in relation to the UNESCO uh, declaration, which you talked about, and how it actually provides. I think many of uh, the solutions to how we might uh, account for, you know, cultural expression within those agreements. So I think it's important for a lot of people who aren't familiar with UNESCO, aren't familiar with how that declaration was even developed to have some context. So certainly uh, if if you could sort of explain how that declaration came about, that would be uh, amazing. The issue of how Canada's culture is dealt with in trade agreements has been controversial since 1986 when we launched our free trade talks with the United States. Uh, In that agreement, in the CPTPP, and in NAFTA 2019, it was a major sticking point, and one of the final issues settled. And despite proclamations from 1986 to 2018 uh, that Canada has a cultural exemption, Uh, I submit that in each of these agreements, there have been changes made to Canadian cultural policies, and overall, our cultural policy-making space has been restricted. So to understand, first of all, why we need cultural policies and how these are affected by trade agreements, I want to compare, I think the most useful thing to do is to compare Canada's television and feature film industries. Canadian television is successful. We celebrate our stars. We watch Canadian dramas, comedies, documentaries, and children's programs. And these programs are increasingly popular abroad. In the last year that figures are available, 2017-18, we produced more than 1,200 television movies, series, and other shows with a total production value of $2.73 billion. Meanwhile, Canada's film industry struggles. In that same year, We produced only 105 movies with total budgets just over $300 million. And remember, a major American Hollywood blockbuster will cost more than $100 million U.S. to produce and distribute. U.S. movies took close to 90% of the Canadian box office. The remaining 10% is independently produced films and films from other countries. And after years even lower, Canada's English language feature films reached an anemic 1% market share in 2017-18. 
But the writers, directors, actors, the technicians who tell the stories in television and in films are generally the same people. It's using the same infrastructure. Canadians succeed in Hollywood. We've got lots of Canadian actors, lots of well-known writers, lots of directors in Hollywood who are from Canada. So why is there this huge discrepancy? Put simply, it's because in television, we have a wide array of very effective policies that support production and exhibition of Canadian television programs, and we don't have those in film. It's about more than funding. In that year, 54% of total television production budgets came from public sources. That could be direct grants, tax credits, funding from the state-owned enterprises, CBC, Telefilm, and so on. And that compared to 54% in television, and that compared to 59% of total film budget. So there's not a huge difference in the, in, the, in the granting. But where the huge difference comes is the fact that in television, we have restrictions on foreign ownership. We have requirements on private broadcasters and cable companies to fund Canadian content production and to schedule it in a preferential place on our television screens. So we have, in my submission, we have three kinds of cultural policies in Canada. First, our grants and subsidies. Those are very important uh, and have always been a mainstay. Second, we have the public cultural institutions, you know, in trade terms, the state-owned enterprises that can be CBC, Telefilm, Canadian Media Fund, and all of the provincial outfits and all of the local institutions as well. And finally, the third category is we have these structural measures that I call them, which are preferential treatment in copyright laws that protect the Canadian market. We have Section 19.1 of the Income Tax Act, which prohibits Canadian businesses, or if a Canadian business advertises on a U.S. border station or in a foreign magazine distributed in Canada, that's not an eligible business expense for under the Income Tax Act. We have the foreign ownership rules and we have the content regulation. So Canadian cultural policies then come into conflict with trade agreements since on their face, they violate some of the so-called principles of free trade. Trade agreements generally permit a country to subsidize domestic producers, but most of the structural measures we have are contrary to requirements like the requirement to provide national treatment in your own market for foreigners, the concept of providing most favored nation treatment, which means that if you treat one foreigner in one way, you have to treat all other foreign companies in the same way, because all of those measures give preferential treatment to domestic suppliers, producers, and investors or those with whom we have a special relationship like the television and film co-production treaties. And many of these measures can also violate the prohibition on performance requirements. Um, in, in, in the latter years of the trade agreements, we're starting to see more coverage of the state-owned enterprises. And so there are some issues that we're beginning to confront there. But what we've confronted for the first, since 1986-87, has been this pressure on our structural policies. So that's why we need cultural policies in my view and how they come into conflict with trade agreements. Let me just wrap this up by uh, pointing back to the Canada-US uh, free trade negotiations in 1986-87. At that time we were contemplating the introduction of a very strong film importation bill that would have required a Canadian film distributor to distribute every movie uh, to be distributed in Canada. Now, why? Because Canadian film producers would, they do invest in Canadian movies, foreign film distributors do not, by and large. Um, there was also a discussion about the potential of having cinema screen quotas to requiring a certain content of Canadian movies and Canadian theater screens. But during the negotiating process, what was leaked as we came to the conclusion uh, and this is recorded in the, in the debates in the House of Commons. There was a memo that was discussing the terms of the Canada-US free trade agreement. And a US official reported that Canada had agreed, quote, to solve Motion Picture Association of America President Jack Valenti's problem. What was Jack Valenti's problem? The, the fact that we were contemplating strong measures in the film distribution business. The government of the day, the conservative government of the day, vehemently denied the report that we had made any deal. But I think it's obvious that the, and no coincidence that the film distribution policy was greatly weakened 
and no quota was introduced. And that's what's led to the, the situation today where we have success in television, we have, we, have, we have struggled to achieve even a two or 3% market share in our own market in the film industry. When we, in Canada, uh, so we negotiated a, a cultural exemption in a free trade agreement. It wasn't as robust as we might think it is because we also agreed to make certain changes in policies formally in the negotiating process, as well as informally the solving of Jack Valenti's problems. We continued that cultural exemption into NAFTA. It was weaker uh, because it wasn't a direct exemption. It merely incorporated the terms of the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement into it. And so in Canada, we began to get this idea that really this was not a very good strategy, this negative strategy of always being against the trade agreements uh, and always trying to argue for an exemption from the agreements. And what we needed was a more positive strategy. And so we developed this idea of an international treaty that would basically regulate trade and cultural goods and services and remove that uh, tr the trade and cultural goods and services from the trade agreement and have a standalone document. And so it would confirm the right of parties to support their own artists and cu cultural producers however they wanted, uh, uh, but would also require that they begin to engage in new forms of cultural collaboration. So that convention uh, idea was gradually adopted be between about 1999 and 2003, there was a major international campaign involving both civil society as well as culture ministers who were organized by Canada's minister, Sheila Cobbs, into a network. But one of the things which is interesting about that is that the CCA was actually quite heavily involved in convening a <laughs> civil society group, right? Absolutely. The first uh, big civil society meeting which launched this idea of creating a global civil society network on cultural diversity was held in Ottawa. And it was brilliantly titled, it was called At Home in the World. And it was a conference that was held in parallel with a meeting of culture ministers that Sheila Copps called. And it was the Canadian Conference of the Arts along with a Swedish organization of artists and cultural professionals, which called that meeting. And that meeting of some 200 delegates said we need to launch an international campaign around this topic. And indeed, the, the way I got involved was precisely because of my involvement with the Canadian Conference of the Arts. And it's how we launched the International Network for Cultural Diversity. I became its executive director. And that was the decade that I spent uh, uh, promoting this idea for the convention and then being involved in the negotiation of the convention. The convention was negotiated in a remarkably short time frame for what potentially was a controversial proposition. UNESCO agreed to take on this task in 2003, and by 2005, it had negotiated the terms of the convention, and those terms were approved in October of 2005 at a meeting of the General Conference of, the, of UNESCO. Only two states opposed it. One was the United States, the other was Israel. Every other state either voted in favor or there were 20 odd who, who abstained in the final vote. So that's, that's the background to the convention. Where are we now uh, in 2019? I mean, that was 14 years ago. I mean, are we, are we do you think we're any closer to actually uh, fulfilling sort of the, the, the vision of what yourself and the other people around the table were hoping to achieve? <laughs> the short answer is no. The longer answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, so I want to put on the table, first of all, that a major factor, of course, in the last 15 years has been the development of the digital environment and its tremendous impact on the way that creative expressions are produced or created, produced, distributed and made available to audiences. And one of the big problems we've had in Canada is our failure our absolute refusal to regulate digital technologies. And that's just now beginning to change. And that's a very big factor in all of this because it creates a whole new set of problems for uh, when we come to the trade agreements. Okay, so where are we? Since my book is really about the international trade, I need to put on the table that the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership is the worst trade agreement that we have ever negotiated from a, the perspective of culture. Uh, the background of the CPTPP is that 
when the Trans-Pacific Partnership was first negotiated and the U.S. was part of it, um, there were serious, serious problems for the cultural industries. It had a totally different structure. It was not based on a broad cultural exemption. Instead, the electronic commerce chapter exempted broadcasting and exempted subsidies and grants, but everything else was included. And then Canada took an approach that in international trade terms is called listing non-conforming measures and taking a reservation against obligations on a chapter by chapter basis. And in fact, not only did we have this modest approach of taking reservations, but we restricted the scope of our own reservation. We said, we have a right to take these actions in support of our own arts and culture, except we will not do these things. We will not have any discriminatory measures against online uh, services providers. We will not have any discriminatory measure, uh, measures against in certain other parts of, of, of the world of culture. So we restricted our own reservation. So two points, first of all, uh, not listing non-conforming measures and reservations are very weak ways to protect your sovereign right to take action. Because the principle in international trade law is that everything should be liberalized. And by its very definition, a non-conforming measure says, hey, this measure doesn't conform to what we've just agreed to in this agreement. And so in international trade world, you are permitted to retain existing measures but you can't make them any stronger. You have to make them weaker if you're gonna change them. And the expectation is ultimately you'll liberalize the sector, that these are limited, time limited, uh, because they're not an exemption. They're simply, you've taken a reservation, you've said, we wanna retain the right to do this, but you're agreeing overall that these kind of measures are inappropriate in this new trade world. So that's, that's problem number one with the CPTPP. And problem number two is the electronic commerce chapter. So probably the best thing that's happened to the Canadian cultural sector in the last uh, two or three years was Donald Trump's uh, fourth day in office when he said that he was withdrawing the Americans from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And what happened is the other, rem the remaining 11 member countries said, well, we want to continue this agreement. And Canada finally figured out the serious negative consequences for culture in the TPP. And so the last minute deal that was made by the Canadian government, where the, the, the culture minister, Melanie Jolie, said, we've achieved the cultural exemption, was a mechanism known as side letters. So they negotiated with each other party a side letter that said, well, you know, Canada's taken these reservations and we've limited these reservations in these following two ways. So guess what? We now agree that we're going to remove those limitations. So it's still a reservation approach. The other party has now said, we understand you're now removing the limitations you put on your own reservation. And, and, and the government said, we've, we've exempted culture. Well, that's not true. That's just not true. The basic flaws in the agreement remain. And it's, it's a serious problem for us. And I use the example in my book. Um, Japan is party to the, uh, the CPTPP. And of course, Sony Pictures and Sony Entertainment is a Japanese company. They're also a major Hollywood studio and major music producer as well. And if Canada were ever to try now to regulate film distribution in the way that we were talking about uh, 25 years ago, Sony would have a really good right to take us uh, to a dispute settlement under the investor state dispute settlement system arguing that their operations in Canada would be seriously negatively affected by such a decision. If the U.S. were ever to rejoin the CPTPP, and that's a real possibility post-Trump, then we'd be in real trouble with respect to all of the film industry. So that's the CPTPP. So we need to look for an alternative. And this is, I think, what you were talking about, Christian. What, what's, what's a more positive approach to this? Well, in my opinion, the positive approach should be to use the UNESCO Convention. The UNESCO Convention is a very strong document. It didn't go as far as we wanted it to go, right? Because it doesn't trump the trade agreements. We also talked about some of the language that's used. Like it talks about like, instead of shall, it's like shall endeavor to. So yep. there, there tends to be some really lukewarm commitments within the actual language itself. 
Yes, the UNESCO Convention, it first of all talks a lot about the right of governments to support their own artists and cultural producers. And those rights are expressed as a principle in the preamble, <laughs> as an operative provision. So it's very strong on saying countries have a right to support their own artists and cultural producers however they want. Now, commitments for new forms of cultural collaboration, cultural cooperation, are more modest because those, aren't, those are posed as the discretionary may do these things rather than the obligatory shall. May can also be shall endeavor to. You only have to try, you don't have to accomplish it. So the obligation side is pretty modest, right? And that's one of the criticisms of the UNESCO Convention. So the right, the right to regulate is very strong, but there's really very few obligations on parties to each other. Particularly important, of course, in a global sense, is the obligations to help developing countries to develop their cultural industries and uh, are, are also weak. Uh, and they could be made stronger, although there is some good language within it. But it does say that these countries support the sovereign right of states to support their own artists and cultural producers. So in my opinion, what we should do is we should use the UNESCO Convention as a basis for the negotiation of agreements amongst all the countries that are party to that UNESCO Convention. And that's 144 member states plus the European Union. Around uh, cultural expression issues or cultural... That, that's yeah. correct. So it's the UNESCO Convention on the protection and the promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions. Yeah. So if you want to protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions, then you can both agree that you're going to be bound by the provisions of the convention. So let's use a very current example. We just wrote, uh, ACTRA just wrote to the government about the proposed free trade agreement with China. Now, there's a whole other set of problems with, with that. But what you could do is you say that Canada's relationship with China with respect to the diversity of cultural expressions is governed by the UNESCO Convention. So we, each of us, have the right to support our own artists and cultural producers however we want. But it also says we should be creating new forms of international cultural collaboration. So what could you do with China? Well, let's have more cross-border movement of performing arts, of musicians, so that we can see each other's culture in, in our own countries. It's, it would be very easy to do that. And then the big one for Canada would be to negotiate a co-production treaty in television. We have a co-production treaty in film, but there's not a, a great deal of activity under that agreement, but there could be substantially more production under a Canada-China television co-production treaty. And that's a way that you'd be mutually supporting each other and developing Canadian cultural industries. So just use the UNESCO convention. Say, we both support the UNESCO convention. We both recognize the right that each of us has to support our own artists, cultural producers, cult cultural distributors, and we'll try to build on that relationship to develop more cross-border movement of artists and cultural products. It's interesting because I think China has that sort of bilateral agreement with New Zealand, and New Zealand sort of got in, they're able to benefit by sort of having an understanding of how that relation, although they probably didn't, I, they didn't use the sort of the, the language within the uh, UNESCO document, but I mean, they have been successful in, in sort of bilateral cultural conversations around film and television, which is interesting. Again, let's distinguish between film and television here. Many countries oh, yeah, have, yeah, 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 of course, many, of course, yeah. many, many countries have film co-production treaties with China. We can come back if you want to talk about film in China. I, I, I could briefly, but this okay. is a television co-production treaty. Yeah, You're yeah, right. Yes. New Zealand is the only country in the world that has negotiated a television co-production treaty with China. And there's a great deal of production that's currently going on between New Zealand and China as a consequence. And it's funny that one of the major beneficiaries of that is is a former government production it's agency is it, it's a canadian company that owns the the new zealand broadcaster is that right or the production company is there it, was uh, can i <laughs> yes yeah, <sorry. laughs> one of the major beneficiaries of this co-production treaty 
is a former production arm of one of the New Zealand government institutions that was privatized. It does a lot of documentaries, nature documentaries, that kind of thing. And it was just recently purchased by Blue Ant, which is a Canadian company. So one of the major beneficiaries of the New Zealand-China television co-production treaty is Blue Ant, a Canadian company based in Toronto. Good on them. We should be doing that for all television producers in Canada by negotiating our own co-production treaty. I have a question and it comes to how we are differentiating between the film market and the television market. And now we have these streaming markets which kind of play a role in both, but also their own. Could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Because I, I wanna jump into some of the deep end on that, but at the same time, I think that this is a good segue to kind of differentiate what place that has within all of this? That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, and, and I just briefly made reference to the fact that digital technologies is changing everything here. And so, yes, what you now have in Canada is a challenge. It's the, our broadcasting regulations are breaking down. And the reason they're breaking down is because you have big digitally based companies that are distributing films and television beyond the regulatory arm of the Canadian government, the CRTC at the moment. So we call them over the top OTT services. And so Netflix uh, is not regulated at the moment by the CRTC. Netflix does not register for or charge the uh, harmonized sales tax. Netflix does not have any obligations to produce or schedule Canadian content. So it has a competitive advantage over the Canadian players in the system by a long shot, tremendous competitive advantage. And in my view, we have to begin to regulate that market so that we can ensure that we can have diverse product within it rather than just whatever, you know, the programmers in Los Angeles and New York decide that we should have available to us. There's many examples in the world. We're way behind Europe. We're way behind other countries in regulating the digital world. It is possible to regulate the digital world. It's funny that Netflix, about 18 months ago, when they were asked about registering for and paying HST and why they don't do it, they said, well, nobody asked us to. <laughs> they currently pay taxes in Australia. They pay taxes in most European countries now, uh, but they don't pay them in Canada because the government didn't say you should be registering for collecting and remitting HST. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there is this uh, odd, I mean, you address this in the book, but there's this odd misconception that the Canadian government cannot find a model or a solution to actually taxing them, but that's actually not the case. I mean, you mentioned that there's like a two and a half percent tax in France and there's even something that's starting to unfold in uh, Quebec. So it is possible. It's just for some reason there isn't the wherewithal, maybe because the Googles of the world are slightly cozying up to some of the ministers in the uh, federal government, I don't know, and are, are trying to avoid this by by uh, offering the, the $500 million production solution as a way to circumvent probably paying a lot more in uh, GST and HST to the government. Yes, Europe now has a couple of interesting directions, European directives. So it applies to all member states of the European Union, including Britain until October 31st. And they have to regulate. They have to require that the over-the-top companies begin to pay taxes. So that's the HST issue. They have to have European content in their inventory. And they also may impose a levy. So member states of the European Union may impose a levy that would go to support domestic production. And both France and Germany have done that. And Netflix had challenged the German uh, tax. This was before the European directive, the German levy, but it, that, their challenge was unsuccessful in court. So that's beginning to happen now in Europe. The OTT services are collecting and remitting taxes as appropriate. In fact, they're going to be taxed and many countries are now imposing a levy to support domestic production, and they have to have in their inventory at least a certain percentage of European content that they're offering to European consumers. I mean, you make a, you make a really good point, Christian. There's, there's also a, a new copyright directive in Europe, and you had a major campaign by Google and Facebook and Amazon, <laughs> in which they were arguing that these new copyright laws would favor these huge multinational entertainment industry firms. And 
the absurdity of it seemed lost on them that these are the wealthiest countries in the world trying to argue that these copyright measures are going to benefit the record industry, <laughs> the film and television industry at the expense of Google and Facebook, who are the size of the whole bloody industry in Europe. You talked before about this competitive advantage issue, especially for Canadian broadcasters. And, and you know, they pay, they, I think it's a 5% levy they pay on their revenues into the Canadian media fund to sort of support Canadian film and television production, I believe. Clayton and I sort of come from other industries. I mean, we, we, we spend a lot of time working in the visual arts, live performance. There's probably a logical way that similar levies could go to, you know, artist collectives for those various disciplines to support artists in those fields as well, I imagine. First of all, the competitive disadvantage, it's Canadian television distributors, so cable companies, satellite companies, they're required to pay 5% of their gross revenues okay. into their production fund. Broadcasters have different regulations. They're required to spend typically 30% of their expenses they have to spend on their Canadian content production. And a certain subset of that has to be on programs of national interest, drama, scripted comedy, and so on. So there is certainly nothing to stop us from introducing regulations that would require contributions to industries that are definitely associated with the film and television industries. There's no question about that. We could do that if we wanted to do that. Again, it could be subject to some challenges and complaints because that's requiring private industry to redistribute a portion of their earnings for a different purpose. That could be contrary, again, to the performance requirement, prohibition in trade treaties. Uh, you know, So you'd have to look at the particular agreement, the particular treaty and its language and so on. Um, I should say that one of the things we haven't talked about, which is, for me is really important, is the cultural industries, we continue to use a definition that was developed in 1986. So we say these are the cultural industries. We even talk about this thing called, you know, stuff that's available in machine readable form. <laughs> this is not a definition uh, that really reflects the current technologies uh, or the way that artists might be creating in future. And particularly I note artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of those technologies, they may not be covered by the cultural industries definitions. And certainly what is not covered by the cultural industry's definitions, performing arts, visual arts, and crafts. Those forms of our cultural industries are not covered by our cultural exemption. So what does that mean? Up to this point, it hasn't meant a lot because we don't really have structural support measures for those industries. We tend to use grants and contributions as the way to support those industries. But your question, Christian, was exactly on point. What if we began to require that certain producers of cultural products should be making a contribution to Canadian content in theaters or to Canadian artists who are working in visual arts or new, new media technologies who are beginning to, to explore virtual reality, right? That would be a structural measure rather than a direct funding measure. And that's where the lack of inclusion in the definition could be very problematic. I had this question, but it takes us back just a little bit, but uh, not that I don't get extremely excited about what you just said, but I don't want to lose these thoughts that I have. And one of them was a question about why with the kind of current setup that CRTC has and sort of that OTT system of uh, letting these different service providers that have services that aren't being regulated, wh why are the broadcasters or the people that are being regulated not creating a public outcry about the idea that they're basically not able to compete in this system? Like the, the idea that by organizations that are doing streaming platforms, having no regulation, that that <laughs> gives them this absolutely unfair advantage to to do whatever they want while another company is being regulated and having to follow all these rules like why why am i not hearing that more basically that's a really good question uh on the one hand they are in the campaign right they do say yes we need a level playing field yes if that means you're going to regulate these guys then that's the way to do it on the other hand we're talking about in canada huge vertically integrated companies 
Rogers, Bell, Shaw have not only everything from production arms through distribution arms through broadcasters, they have the telephone companies, they're providing the internet services and all of that kind of stuff. And so funnily enough, to the extent that they can get deregulation and particularly if they could ever get that prohibition on foreign ownership in the Canadian industries, if they could get that removed, the value of their company would shoot up. It would be worth three times the size, four times the size it is at the moment. And so they're in this kind of contradictory position. So yes, on the one hand, they're there. So don't, don't get me wrong. You know, they're there. They say the right things at, at times. But on the other hand, there's this kind of corporate interest down the road that really is contradictory to that. Because if they get deregulation, as they would really like to see, the value of their companies would shoot up. Well, I should say, you know, we haven't really talked about it. One of the other strengths of the UNESCO Convention is this real requirement to encourage diversity within, right? We've been talking about diversity between countries here. And yes, that's a big part of the convention. It's about diversity between countries. But it also talks about the importance of promoting diversity within every country to reflect the diversity of cultural expressions, the diversity of communities, cultures, languages, and so on that are within every country. And that's another way that it can be a really powerful tool in a bigger sense. You know, I argue that, you know, you were looking for, uh, Christian was asking me about the alternative, you know, about using the UNESCO convention. I think progressive forces in the United States, in the arts and culture world, should really try to encourage their government to join the convention on the protection and promotion of diversity of cultural expressions, because that's as much about their problems, which is their own lack they don't see their own stories on their own television screens or in their own books, right? Because they don't have the access that they need to bring those stories to life. And so they could work on getting the U.S. to join because that would help them to promote diversity within. So for me, that's another big part of the equation. I don't talk about it so much in the book because that's about diversity between countries rather than diversity within. But diversity within, for me, obviously is very, very important. I have a small question with deregulating broadcasters. That, that's like definitely been talked about and like I've heard that language used, but is digital so incompatible with the existing structures that they can't just change language in the document to talk about delivery system? And just instead of deregulating the existing places, include other platforms into the regulation? Well, the answer to that one is the broader political answer that under the previous government and the previous commissioner, the, the previous chair of the CRTC, they had a deregulatory agenda, right? And so they wanted to deregulate the system and, and the CRTC indeed has taken steps to move away from some of the strict regulations they used to have. The political circumstances have changed. The new head of the commission is now very much understanding the Broadcasting Act requires regulation and he's committed to that, the government's committed to that. Because the answer to your question is yes, you could do it. There's nothing to stop you. You know, they, we talk about the old exemption order. So CRTC years ago exempted, you know, digital broadcasting. But under that exemption order, they, they said, this is broadcasting. We just, the new media world, we just, don't know, we don't think we need to regulate it because there's enough Canadian content. So I think the CRTC could in fact regulate if they chose to do, or if the government gave them a direction to do that. And hopefully the next government will do it, the one elected next month. It's appropriate that you bring up the election. Do you think there are any significant proposals that are going to be within any of the platforms that these parties put forward, or especially around sort of structural policy language? So the Liberals, what have they done over the last, you know, four years? They've, they've added money. They've, there's no question. They boosted the budget of the CBC. They boosted the budget of the Canada Council. There's all new forms of programs that they have, but they have not taken the major steps. Now, I think you will see in the liberal platform, because basically Pablo Rodriguez, the new culture minister, more or less put this on the table in a recent presentation or speech in Quebec, where he said, look, we couldn't regulate the internet. I'm paraphrasing. We couldn't regulate Netflix because what happened in the election campaign last time Harper said no Netflix tax, and Trudeau said 
no Netflix tax. But this is a new election. This will be a new government. And I suspect you'll see in the Liberal Party platform some recognition of the need to regulate the digital services. So I think you'll see that in their platform. Clearly, the NDP is on side with that. I'm not sure about the Green Party, but obviously they would have a lot of sympathy for it. And clearly, the outliers then in this election campaign will be the Conservative Party of Canada, because I fully expect that they would once again be saying, no, we favor deregulation, uh, no Netflix tax, no iPod tax. It's a, you know, it's a simple slogan that seems to appeal to people on a certain level. That's interesting. I mean, there are sort of non-tax related structural changes that you've also talked about in the book uh, around things like algorithms. Like this idea that the internet is somehow neutral and benign. Things have changed dramatically in the last 10 years around how content is now curated. You know, what, one of the things you talk about is making searches on search engines like Google much more geared towards at least giving you some options around Canadian content. So there are obviously also some structural policy changes that might be brought in around algorithms, I imagine. Absolutely. I totally agree. I'm old enough to remember, and you two guys aren't. When Google first came on the scene, you would type in a search term, and Google would ask you a question. Would you like to limit your search to Canadian sites? Yes or no? We don't get asked that question anymore. Now, the algorithms are sophisticated enough. They know I'm in Toronto, so they tend to focus on that. But my point is this, that there's nothing to stop them. My view, Christian, is we cannot, in this current digital environment, force people to watch anything. Gone are the days where we only had two television networks in Canada, and you could only choose one of the two of them. We can't force people to watch anything or to consume any cultural content. But surely we should make sure they have alternatives available. Hi, Gary. I see you had a hard day at work tonight. Would you like to watch a movie? This is Cortana speaking to me. <laughs> yes, I'd like, yes, I'd like to watch a movie. Well, here's a couple that you might be interested in. And then there's this Canadian movie you might also be interested in. What do you think? This is what it's about. Just make those choices available to me. I think this is another area. I think if we went to some of the big search firms, if we went to Google and said, just make sure in your list of options you're providing to people, if they're looking for cultural expressions, creative content, give them some Canadian choices every time they're doing that. If they finally say, no, I want number two and it's an American movie, fine. As long as they've had an ability to make a choice, a real choice, and that includes having some of our own productions, our own artists made available to them because some of them will say, yeah, let's try that Canadian artist. You know, that sounds like an interesting movie. Why don't you show me that tonight? Yeah, also without any kind of regulation, you're trusting the uh, corporation to just following their own kind of code of ethics and, and therefore it's not always transparent <laughs> what that ethical behavior is. And, you know, as an example, a search engine could be prioritizing companies that they own that happen to be local as opposed to just what is relevant to your search. And, and we've seen all kinds of that information coming out. A good example that you just made me think of, and I'm not sure if there was regulation behind this, but where Air Canada had started prioritizing Canadian films, Francophone films, and then at one point they even had showcases from the film festival Imaginative uh, as their in-flight viewing material. And it was this acknowledgement of um, you're on a Canadian airline provide Canadian content and that there's a high value to non-Canadian clients who might be on that flight because this is the opportunity to get exposure to the place that you are visiting or, or you know, leaving. But, but again, that notion of self-regulated by the idea of it being valuable as opposed to a shared consensus of the value that makes it mandatory for when corporations don't find that valuable and somehow we'll just avoid it or, or th there's nothing stopping them. Absolutely. Here, that's another good example. Air Canada should be making those kind of options available to that captive audience they have. Again, we can't force anybody to choose anything in particular, but make them available. Promote them a little bit. Say, this is something a little bit different that reflects First Nations culture in Canada, you know, you might be really interested in watching it. So just make it available. I agree with you. You know, the algorithms are proprietary. Nobody knows how they, the various search engines work and 
the kind of algorithms they have. And I think this is one where if they don't agree to prioritize Canadian stuff, then yeah, let's regulate them. I think you could do that too. Just a simple, you've got, what, we can get 12 things up on a on, on typical screen when you put in a Google search term. If it's for a cultural expression, hey, we'll require that two of them be, you know, Canadian content, one should be French content, one should be from a First Nations community content, just require them to do it if they don't voluntarily agree to make it available. I think in the end, they probably would voluntarily agree. Yeah, I agree. I think on that note, we might wrap things up. Do either of you have a sort of final thought? I should make one comment. You know, I said that the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership was the worst agreement that we've ever negotiated. <laughs> But I want to say that NAFTA 2019, they actually did a good job. NAFTA 2019 has a very strong cultural exemption. It's an exemption from all of the chapters, including digital trade chapter. They did a good job of extending that exemption. In the old NAFTA, it had been very, very narrow and very problematic. It's much, much better. The problem in NAFTA 2019 remains the definition. It's the 1986 definition of cultural industries. It doesn't include visual arts, performing arts, crafts, and that could be problematic in NAFTA 2019. We also agreed to change a few of our cultural policies. That's the pattern that we've adopted. But overall, that's a very strong cultural exemption. I finish on that note because that's really important when you look at the potential uh, expansion of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, if the United States, when the United States comes back to rejoin that, then we would be able to say, wait a minute, NAFTA 2019 is the last time we have bilaterally negotiated the issue of culture. That's the latest agreement we've reached. And so before you join CPTPP, you have to agree with us that that's the basis of our relationship on culture is NAFTA 2019. That's the last agreement we reached. That's international law. It's something called, Christian, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties says that if, you know, if there's contradiction in treaties between the same two governments, then the basic rule is the last one you agree to represents the most contemporary understanding of that part of your relationship. So that's excellent. Clay, do you have any final uh, thoughts or words? Oh, I, I've got so many things that I want to talk to Gary about. <laughs> and I just want to remind viewers that, you know, thank you for supporting mass culture. Um, and think about look, you know, getting this book, Canadian culture in a globalized world. Thanks to Gary for sharing his, time not only on this uh, interview but also in preparing this book it takes a lot of work and I feel like you've done it at a very timely uh, point in the cycle of elections that exist in Canada and uh, the sort of this liberal government has sort of looked more outward uh, in its relationships uh, using culture as part of that uh, conversation so I think this this document provides a lot of context for people who really need uh, need need that context. So I thank you for doing that. And thank you to Clayton uh, Windat for also coming and joining me in this uh, conversation. Thank you both. Thank you all. Okay. Really Bye. exciting stuff. Have a great day, everybody. To find out more about Gary Neal, Clayton Windat, and Christian Clark, check out massculture.ca. While you're there, Join the growing MC network as a way of staying connected to cultural research. Goodbye.